them with the spirit of, of holiness at this time. We pray, Father, for all those who are attending across the world that you are going to bless us with a word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so allow me to introduce, welcome our chairman, uh, Brother Thaddeus Bruno, who ministers in uh, the congregation in West Side in uh, Bermuda uh, by this time, and chairman of the annual Caribbean Lectureship, Brother Thaddeus Bruno. Thank you very much, Brother Michael. I appreciate uh, your good work. Um, on behalf of the Regional Organizing Committee, it is my privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to invite you to, to welcome you rather to the second ACL virtual event. Uh, this is something we've been talking about, we've been praying about, we are excited about, and finally, it is here. I know we will say a hearty amen to that. Of course, we will certainly agree that this has been all made possible because of our awesome God. Uh, it is because of his mercy, because of his grace, because of his goodness lavished upon us this very day. Indeed, we share the sentiments expressed by Jeremiah in Lamentations, that God's blessings are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. And so we want to acknowledge God and thank him uh, for his presence with us uh, this evening. I want to also acknowledge the audience. I've been taking a peek at the audience and I can tell you from my vantage point, it's, it's a beautiful audience. <laughs> Amen. Uh, beautiful and diversified. I've been noticing we have uh, people of all ethnicities, and that's the way God wants it. That's the way we like it. The song says red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. It's also diversified among uh, uh, gender lines. We got some brothers. We have some sisters. It's diversified along nationalities, and we are grateful uh, for this. I also want to specially welcome uh, uh, visitors, those who are not part of the Fellowship of Churches of Christ. Um, you honor us with your presence this evening, and we um, salute you and thank you for choosing to be with us um, this evening. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to do. Um, as chairman, um, I want to talk a little bit about our theme and what you can expect, uh, not only this evening, but throughout the event. And then I want to invite you to um, help me pay tribute to two really uh, special persons. Um, the theme of this year's lectureship, as you know, is a light to the nations. And this was chosen by our committee, the Regional Organizing Committee. And one of the major objectives we had in selecting this was to announce the truth that our God is alive and he's well, uh, particularly coming out of the COVID era. Maybe we're still in it, but uh, there's been so much loss, um, so much hurt, we thought it would be an excellent idea to affirm that God is still on his throne. We also want to call attention to God's work among us. He's not only alive, but he is at work among his people, among his servants. And we wanted to focus attention on what he has called us to be and to do in the present era. I want to promise you as chairman that throughout this event, you will be informed, you will be reminded, you will be equipped, you will be motivated. Indeed, you will be challenged. You will receive new insights, new energy, and a revival of hope to live as a Christian. Our prayer 
is you will leave this event with a greater commitment to Jesus and the gospel. I invite you now to bear with me a little bit as I seek to uh, share my screen with you as we uh, pay tribute to a couple of persons who've been there and there to us. Let's try this again and hope for better. All right, the presumption is you can see my screen. Excellent. Scripture reminds us that we should render therefore to all their deeds, talking about government officials and persons in authority, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. And from our perspective at the Regional Organizing Committee, we certainly owe a debt to uh, a couple of brothers who have served the Regional Organizing Committee and the Annual Caribbean Lectureship uh, with distinction. And I want to invite you to help me say uh, thanks to them on this occasion. The first one, is Brother Francis A. York. Um, just a wonderful person, a, a handsome brother, as, as you can tell from that, uh, from that photo. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Francis with regards to um, his work with the ROC. Uh, Brother Ken Dai, who is going to follow me, will probably tell you a little more. But Brother York is our first uh, chairman. Um, Brother Dai had been um, running things for a number of years. And then when the time came, he thought about um, having a committee within the Caribbean. Brother Francis York um, immediately came to mind. He was selected. He was appointed because of great commitment that he had shown to the event. So he's really the first chairman of the Regional Organizing Committee. He served in that role for at least uh, thir uh, 18 years. And over the course of the 50 years of the annual Caribbean lectureship, Brother York has missed a mere 50, uh, a mere four events. Um, I think that speaks to um, the love and the commitment that he has had to the ACL. Um, I talked with him in preparation for this and he has shared some thoughts with me that I'd like to share with you. In his own words, he says, during the years that I was chairman of the ROC, I felt humbled to be the chairman. It was never an easy role, but by God's help, I tried to use every opportunity to be as inclusive as possible. At the close of discussions, I would try to ensure that there was unity as much as possible. So there you get a sense of the values that are held by Brother York uh, personally. And of course, he brought those in his work with the lectureship values such as humility, inclusivity, faith, and of course, maintaining unity. And so I want to, on this occasion, um, say on behalf of the ROC and the ACL family, we want to say a hearty thank you. If you're on Facebook, you want to make this moment here go viral. I'm glad I got that word right, considering I'm not a millennial. <laughs> we want to say to Brother York, you're the man, you're Talawa, 
<laughs> Amen. We want to say to Brother York, we love you. We appreciate so much your service to the ROC and the annual cabin lectureship. The next brother to be honored is Brother Terrence Baptiste. And he also served in a number of roles on the ROC. He served as secretary and he served as vice chairman um, and he served as chairman for a brief period and uh, Brother Baptiste got involved with the lectureship in 1983. And during that time, I believe he has missed one or two um, events at the most. And again, that gives you a sense of the love, the commitment, and the willingness of these brothers um, to render the service without pay, without remuneration, but just because of their love uh, for Jesus. Uh, Brother Baptiste has shared a few words. He says, serving on the ROCACL over the past years has been a real pleasure and joy. And he says to me, feel free to contact me regarding ROCACL matters at any time if you think I can be of any assistance. So we don't have a brother who's saying, I'm resigned, I'm done with it, and don't ever contact me again. But even in his resignation, he's offering himself, he's offering his service um, to the ACL. And that captures well um, his spirit. And so to Brother Terrence as well, we want to give him some flowers. How's that? They say present them while they're alive and they can be appreciated. We want to say thank you. And we want to say as well, uh, we love you. I thank you for your kind attention. Time is of the essence. I want to now uh, turn um, the microphone over to Brother Michael Stewart, our chairman, who will introduce and present uh, the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brother Thaddeus Bruno. We appreciate your giving us the pips, as we call it, to your predecessors. Uh, it is with such pleasure, and I think it is quite noble of you as our current chairman. The next speaker is going to be Brother Ken Dai. Brother Ken Dai has been the visionary, as we said. He has been the one who has been leading the charge for the ACL. And for many years, the ACL is now um, over 50 years, and Brother Kenda is beloved. And it is a pleasure, therefore, I want to encourage you to give him that hearty welcome to address us at this time, Brother Kenda. Well, thank you, Brother Michael. What a privilege. I scrolled through a few of the pages where some of you were watching. I didn't have time to look at all of the pages, but my computer says there are 19 pages of people. And so I am so excited that all of you have tuned in. I don't understand it. All of you are getting older, but me. And that's the way it is in the Caribbean, isn't it? I have really missed our lectureship because I have missed being with all of you. <clears throat> one of the things that I get to do at every lectureship and have done it for 50 years, I haven't missed, and I give God all the credit, is that I get to introduce all the islands. And so with one voice, all of you tell me who's watching. I'm listening. Well, I'm, I'm joking with you because all of your mics are muted, but we have people from everywhere. And if, if I could, I'd have you stand. And I know what would happen. Every time I mention nearly any island, Clancy stands. Now, he, he takes this from Leroy Smith. Leroy Smith used to stand every time. Now Clancy does. And he's so tall, we can't overlook him. But 
We have so many island nations, and I want to thank you. And technology is just such a blessing. It's enabling us to do this and see each other as we have never been able to see before. You see, the pandemic was really hard. It closed down many of our churches. And we thought it was a curse. And it's really becoming a blessing because it showed to us what technology can do. And now many of our churches in the Caribbean are streaming. And if you really wanted to, you could go to church every hour by tuning into churches all over the islands. And then if you wanted to, you could go to church all day long on Sunday by tuning in all over the world. And so what we thought was bad is turning out to be good. And I'm sorry we can't get together, but at least technology is enabling us to just at least see each other, smile at each other, see that we're still around. And I want to thank you because during the pandemic, I was seriously ill in the hospital and you all were praying for me and I will never, ever forget it. I... I want to thank Thaddeus for introducing two of the giants of our Caribbean lectureship. One is Terence Baptiste, and the other is Francis York, and they're stepping down from their official leadership. When I reached a point where I just thought it would be better for the Caribbean lectureship to have leadership from the Caribbean, there was just not anybody else that I thought could lead it like Francis York. I've known Francis for over 50 years. He is just one of the best friends I've ever had. I have seen him when he's up and I've seen him when he's down. He's, he's seen me up and down and we've encouraged each other. And so when I asked Francis to take over the leadership, he graciously said yes. I threatened him. I said he had no choice, but he has been leading us all these years, and I am so indebted to him because we, the lectureship is still meeting. We are still one. We still speak to each other. We still like each other. We still love each other, and we can hardly wait to see each other, and that's one of the great blessings of the Caribbean lectureship, and so as I stepped back and Francis stepped forward, I want to thank him publicly, privately, and in any other way I could for all that he did. And then Terrence, Terrence, what, where do I start with Terrence? I think he started uh, the lectureship, oh, in 1983. Well, that was in the early days. And I'm not sure how this developed, but Terrence and I became one mind. When there were issues coming in which we needed to vote on something, I didn't say, Terrence, would you vote with me or would you vote against this issue with me? It was just Terrence and I always saw things alike. He has been such a precious friend. I've been in his home in Grenada. I've communicated with him since he's moved to New York. And with both of these men, I really grieve over the fact that they're dealing with some health issues. And so I want you to pray for Terrence and I want you to pray for Francis that God blesses them with continued good health. Uh, the next thing I'd like to mention is something related to the future. Someone said, I feel that some of my great surprises are still in front of me. And with regard to the Caribbean lectureship, that's kind of the way I feel. Who knows what we'll be doing next? But I do know one of the projects that I'm really working on right now is writing a book that will chronicle the history of the Caribbean lectureship. I can't tell you how thrilled I am, but I'm a little sad that I didn't start it years ago because some of our giants have, 
have gone on to God. And I can't have conversations with them. I'd love to have David Caskey here, and I would talk to him, and he's gone. I'd love to have Cliff Gaines here. Of all of those, I'd love to have Bill Miller. And some of these great men and women have gone on to God, and I just waited too long. And so we're trying to chronicle 50 years of history, and some of the years of the lectureship, we have great documentation on and some we just do not have. And so to each one of you, would you please look in all of your files and in your stacks of paper in your houses and look in your church buildings and see if you have any of the early programs of our Caribbean lectureship. This would be such a blessing if you could find some of the programs that would help us so that we could begin to remember who spoke, who was there, what the theme was. I have about half of the programs, but Paul Blake is helping us publish this work. We hope to have it ready for next lectureship in Grenada. And everyone, uh, if I know your email, I'm going to be in touch with you because I'm asking you for help. And some of you have already responded and you've already sent articles in and it's going to be a compilation from all kinds of people that include many of you. So welcome to the Caribbean Lectureship virtually. Is that right, Thaddeus? Virtually. Welcome to saying good Thank you to these great men who have honored us and helped us and be praying and looking for documentation to help us with our future history of the Caribbean lectureship. So I thank you for these minutes. I'm so glad to see all of you again. And I turn it back to our chairman. I think uh, you meant uh, master ceremonies, but uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, show love for Brother uh, Ken Dye. Amen. And we'll turn over to Brother Michael Stewart, the man in charge. Thank you very much, Brother Ken Dye. Thank you so much for your passionate display and uh, the presentation, the address to us here today. And yes, you. We, although we couldn't unmute our microphones, I want to tell you that we have quite a number of persons and I just want to take just a few minutes to just point out where they are from, because I know that you always love to know where people are calling from. Um, and I see that we have Brother Mahis is in Trinidad and Tobago, Brother Mahis Bisunda. We have also um, from different islands, I may not repeat islands that, that I'm seeing, but I'm seeing St. Vincent. Um, the Oliveri from St. Vincent, glad to have you on board. Um, where else do we see? Aruba, Kelly, Sarah Kelly from Aruba. Thank you very much for checking in. And we have Burnett USA. Yes, Burnett is in the United States. The United Kingdom is Rwanda. Rwanda, I'm seeing Rwanda iPhone. It's better if you have your actual name on your screen. And we have Jamaica, Ingrid Green. We have again, um, is it Virginia we seen? Wow, we seen St. Lucia, the cornbread family. We have in Bahamas, New Providence, Bahamas. Cecile, wow, so many people. Barbados, Yvonne Haynes, uh, Grenada. Well, see, we have not spoken about. So continue to put where you are calling from or where you are viewing from, sorry. Puerto Rico, Carmen, who also is on our committee. Bonnet is here. Wow. My brother, Ken I would have loved to call these out himself. I'm sure he didn't recognize that you all were responding by saying where you're calling from. Brother Ken I know that you, you, you missed this. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we are getting ready to go into the seven o'clock hour with our time, actually. 
And uh, we have our song leader who is lined up, Brother Kenneth Hodge. Brother Kenneth Hodge is our song leader, healing from Trinidad and Tobago. We have Brother Kenneth Hodge and Damian Lowe. They both will be our song leaders leading us at this time. So uh, you need to be singing even though your microphones are off i want everybody to be singing where you are if it is possible leave your mic your your cameras on let us see you miming the song love to see your faces from all over we have 514 on the zoom we haven't counted those who are on facebook as yet facebook itself has um right okay facebook already amassing their numbers there so with the no further ado, I now introduce to you our first song leader and followed immediately after by the second song leader, brother um, Kenneth Hodge. Plus, good evening, everyone. Our first song will send the light. There's a call comes ringing, all the restless waves send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light, let us gather jewels, sorry. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. And the golden call offering at the cross we lay, send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for the crown above. Send the light, send the light. Oh, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, oh, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light. Oh, send the light, let us gather jewels for the crown above, send the light, oh, send the light, oh, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Our next song shall be, um, Raise the Banner.
There's a call that comes forth from the fields far and wide. Tis a cry evermore. Who will fight by my side? Raise the banner, shout Hosanna, fill the ranks far and wide. Onward travel, press the battle, Christ or King walks beside. Christ or King walks beside. There are those who've not heard our salvation from sin. Jesus tells in his word that he died for all men. Raise the banner, shout Hosanna, fill the ranks far and wide. Onward travel, press the battle, Christ or King walks beside. Christ or King walks beside. Can we not see the lost, tribes and tongues or the seas? Jesus paid all the cost. Here am my Lord, send me. Raise the banner, shout Hosanna, fill the ranks far and wide. Onward travel, press the battle, Christ or King walks beside, Christ or King walks beside. May your tongues never fail, ere the battle is done, for his word will prevail. Shout aloud, victory won. Or oh, raise the banner, shout Hosanna. Fill the ranks far and wide. Onward travel, press the battle. Christ or King walks beside. Christ or King walks beside. Over to you, Brother Michael. Christ the King walks beside. Thank you very much, Brother Kenneth Hodge from Trinidad. All right, so we're ready for our first speaker. Our first speaker will be introduced by our dear Brother Clancy, who sits on the organizing committee also. So at this time, we ask Brother Clancy to introduce Brother Apple. Brother Clancy, are you there? There we go. Thank you, Mr. Host. The privilege to introduce our first presenter affords me great pleasure. However, while speaking about my friend, mentor, and great servant of God, I must mention his sweet wife, Evelyn, and their children, Jonathan, Benjamin, and Julia. It warms my heart to know our Caribbean audience and the rest of the world know their life and their labor in God's kingdom, for they have blessed many, especially in our region. Jody Lee Apple is a gifted and dedicated student of the Holy Scriptures and as a result is in great demand as a presenter. We are therefore privileged to have been able to secure his availability for tonight's presentation. He comes tonight able and prepared to present on the assigned topic, a light to the nations. He has been an instructor for a number of institutions of biblical learning. Brother Apple has been one of the presenters of the international gospel radio broadcast. He has done mission work in the Northeastern United States and the Caribbean. He has been preaching the gospel for 49 years. He is presently the evangelist for the Belonga Church of Christ in the state of Georgia, United States of America. I am pleased to introduce to some, while presenting to others, our first presenter tonight, 
Jody Lee Apple. Dr. Apple, the microphone is yours. I'm assuming I will be able to do screen share. Is that already set up allowing me to do that? Let's see how that works. Can you see my screen? Is this, was the screen visible? No. Uh, somebody needs to enable me to be able to share a screen. Brother Dorna. Okay, let me try it again. Does not look like I'm able to do that. Ah, now I think I see it. All right, thank you. Can you see it now? Is that good? Okay. The lesson uh, this evening is entitled, A Light to the Nations. Uh, though that idea appears in many texts throughout the scriptures, this one is specifically from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 49 and verse six. I thank all of those who are involved in uh, asking me to participate. I appreciate that very much and uh, welcome the opportunity to share with you a message from God's word. This is an outline of where it is that we're going to go. Uh, under the topic, A Light to the Nations. And for some reason, this is not advancing like it's supposed to. Let's see if there's a get, you, get up here. I'm not sure why this is not working. I apologize for that. Let's try this again. There we go. So this is an order of what we're going to study. We're going to look at uh, the translation of the text. That's our key passage in Isaiah. We're going to look at how the word light is used in the context of the book of Isaiah in a very broad way. Uh, we're going to look next at, for some reason, my slides are not advancing on Zoom. I may have to revert to doing something else here, and I apologize for that. I don't know what the problem is. Let me try this again. All right, give me one second while I restart my slides and hope that this solves everything. I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. Everything's perfect when it works. All right, let's try this again and hope that this has resolved the problem. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, how the translation uh, appears uh, across a number of different texts. We're going to look at how the word is used in the context of Isaiah. And uh, then we're going to look at the context of the exact phrase, a light to and for the nations, just in the context of Isaiah. Then in Luke chapter 2, and finally in Acts chapter 13, uh, before we draw some lessons from today. Uh, and so let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to notice is 
the expression that appears in Isaiah 49 in verse 6 changes from of to two to four in the following translations. Now, that's not significant, perhaps, from your perspective, but I want to share my thoughts about it in just a moment. So the old uh, rendering of the Bishop's Bible uses a light, L-Y-G-H-T, of the Gentiles, appearing as the light of the Gentiles in the Douay and the Geneva versions. It's translated as a night, a light of the nations in Darby and several of the New American uh, translations, and a light of nations in other translations. But it also appears with the word to, a light to the Gentiles in these translations, a light to the nations in these translations. And then finally, a light for the Gentiles, a light for the nations. There's a sense in which something that is of something appears to belong to it. And there's definitely a sense in which the light belongs to the Gentiles because they need to hear it. But it's more appropriate to say that the light is delivered to the Gentiles. That's the task that's presented in the context of the Old Testament text of the book of Isaiah. But another thought that's brought out is it's not just to them, but it's for them. I can give something to you that might not be the best for you. When we present the gospel to someone, the assumption is that it's best for them. And so these translations render it in that way. And I like that, but I am sticking with the uh, assigned uh, uh, topic, a light to the nations. So I just wanted to survey very quickly how that translation appears across a number of different texts. So now I want us to consider how the word light appears across the book of Isaiah. And there's no way that we're going to be able to look at all of these passages, but 32 times in 24 verses, and they're all listed here, some form of light appears in the book of Isaiah. Sometimes it's physical light, sometimes it's spiritual light, sometimes it's very specific. And we're going to give a survey of how it is used as we go a little bit further. And I continue to run into the same issues that I've had before, and I don't know why nothing is advancing, and I apologize for that. I'm going to default to a different means of doing this and keep going. Again, my apologies uh, for the problem here. Let's see if I can do this in a way that I won't have these issues at all. <laughs> All right, let's try once again. This time I'll just show the slides without having them advance. So I'm just going to make this larger so you can see the slide and not have it advance any more on the screen than what you see here uh, because it's giving me a little bit of difficulty, and I apologize for that. All right, so that was the first slide. Let me make it just a little bit smaller so we can see that. And then this is the second slide, and this is where we left off. So I apologize for the difficulty. Uh, I'll have to look into that. But we just noted that the term appears uh, 32 times in 24 passages in the book of Isaiah. And, and I'm not going to emphasize each one of these words in the bottom of the list, but I do want to touch on them very quickly. The word light refers to knowledge. It refers to moral good. In some contexts, in some scriptures, it refers to moral evil. It applies to both physical and spiritual light. It applies to being a reflective light, and that applies most appropriately to us as we reflect God's light and God's glory. In the sense of light compared to weight, that is heaviness, it refers to things of lesser importance. It is a synonym for truth. The term light appears to be synonymous, that is, co-equal with God's nature and God's character. Physically, as we noted before, it is sometimes specified as being the light of stars, the light of moon, the light of sun, or other planets in our sky. It sometimes refer to the early morning light, and then highlighted in bold and red, it's used with reference to a light to the Gentiles, our key topic for this evening. The word light also indicates some semblance of clarity and the ability to see. It's interesting to see the imagery that's presented when it talks about moving physically from blindness to sight, 
but that's also used as a spiritual lesson. We move from blindness to sight. Light is discussed. All of these, by the way, are only in the context of Isaiah as an object of creation and the clarity of purpose, not just with reference to seeing, but the clarity of purpose with reference to holiness, which is our mission in life, to be holy as God is holy. Light is described as a means not only of seeing, but as a pathway. And more often than not, light is looked at as if it were a blessing, because indeed it is. Light is demonstrated, again, all of these only in the context of the book of Isaiah, as a means of goodness that is demonstrated, that is shown to others. Light refers to justice. It describes the final blessing. It describes what we are in our character and our nature and our demeanor that draws other, others uh, to us and ultimately to the truth of who God is and what God desires of them. And then finally, light is used, again, all of these only in the book of Isaiah as the ultimate eternal light. So let's move next to the context of the specific expression, a light to a full of emanations. Looking in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, our key passage, also in Isaiah 9, Isaiah 42, and Isaiah 51, and then Isaiah 62, and then two passages in the New Testament, one in Luke chapter 2, where Jesus is presented in the temple, and Simeon speaks, the one who is waiting for the consolation of Israel, And then in the context of the ministry of Paul, as he was preaching exclusively to the Jews in the synagogues, and when in this context in Acts chapter 13, they reject his message, he said, we turn to the Gentiles. So let's talk first about this passage that is the key uh, to a message this evening and the theme of the entire lectureship, and that is a light to or full of nations from Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. I want you to read this passage when you get a chance. Uh, You're welcome to read it now, of course, and read the entirety of the chapter. And I want you to notice that there's a conversation that's going on in the context of this chapter between God and his servant. And his servant is not me. His servant is not you. In, In this context, his servant is not even the nation of Israel. His servant is Messiah Jesus. And so I want you to note the emphasis of the singularity of light that's brought out here, that's going to carry across the rest of the passages that we note. I am not the light. You are not the light. Even the kingdom of God in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of it in the New Testament, referring to the church, is not the light. It is a bearer of the light. It is a reflection of the light. It is to deliver a message about the Messiah, and the Messiah is the light. And so in Isaiah chapter 49 in verse 6, God is depicted as speaking to his servant in verse 5. That servant is identified as the redeemer of Israel, not Israel, but the redeemer of Israel. He is addressed as being there, Israel's holy one. The singularity of the servant's role in this context cannot be missed and should never be diminished. He is the central light that's under discussion. So the light to the nations in this context, the passage that is the heart of our message this evening, it's Messiah Jesus in chapter 49 and verse 6. He is going to be my salvation, God's accomplished salvation to the ends of the earth. Israel was to be a testament and a testimony and a witness to the coming light to the Gentiles. They themselves were not the saving light, but rather bore witness of that light. And that's going to come into play as we get into the passages of the New Testament, especially as we look at our concluding principles to understand that we are but messengers, light reflectors, not light ourselves. And then in chapter 9, starting in verse 2, this very popular passage that uses a number of names and titles of the Messiah, and it speaks in that context as being a light to the rest of the world. But notice all of these names, the child, the son, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace are all names and descriptors of Jesus. It is Jesus in this context that is the focal point of the light that's under consideration in this passage in the book of Isaiah. Let's move now to Isaiah chapter 42. Again, similar to the passages that we looked at in chapter 49 and in chapter 9. This text addresses the role of Messiah Jesus. Look at the language. 
God through Isaiah identifies him as capital my capital S servant. That's a translation thing to help us understand that this is probably referring to some member of the Godhead in its context, the Messiah who's to come. Yes, it is the case that Isaiah was a servant of God, as a prophet of God, as a prophet who focused in large part on the role of the coming of the Messiah. But he wasn't capital my capital servant. He was not capital my capital elect capital one. That's Jesus. It's Jesus who's going to bring forth justice to the Gentiles, which is a synonymous way of saying light to the Gentiles. Light to the Gentiles and justice to the Gentiles are on par with each other. It is this one, the servant, the elect one, who establishes justice. It's this one, the elect one and the servant, who not only establishes justice to the Gentiles, he's the one who fulfills the bruised reed and smoking flax prophecies from Isaiah that we see in the New Testament. That does not apply to Isaiah, and that does not apply to the nation of Israel. God is going to give you, in this context, the central figure is Messiah Jesus as a covenant to the people. He's the fulfillment of the covenant made with Abraham, repeated by his son Isaac, and repeated to his son Jacob, and continued to become a national promise. Jesus is that light that is fulfillment of that covenant. He is the one who is ultimately a light to the Gentiles, and he is the one who shares God's glory in a way that no other can. Yes, Israel was to be a bearer. Israel was to be a herald of the coming of the Messiah, but they were not the specific light to the Gentiles, but a means of pointing to the one who would be, and that's Messiah Jesus. In the next passage, in Isaiah chapter 51 and in verse 4, God's justice is spoken of when he says, I will make my justice rest as a light of the people's. That, again, is another expression similar to light to the Gentiles that we saw before. My arms will judge the peoples. And in this context, as we saw before, he's referring to how all of these ultimate systems and standards of justice are going to be fulfilled in the person of Messiah Jesus, who is, of course, as we often refer to him as, the second person of the Godhead, equal to God in all respects. Let's look at the last passage in context of this expression, light to and for the nations, and that's the one in Isaiah chapter 62. Again, we've noted that there are many other references to light that have spiritual emphasis and spiritual connotation, but we're focusing only on those that call out light to Gentiles or light to nations or light to others. In this context, the central, the central prophecy focuses on the city of Jerusalem as a means of the light that's going to be born. Jerusalem itself appears as a demonstration of God's righteousness. Now you realize, of course, that during the context of his personal ministry, Jesus often spoke about Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem and said how often he desired to gather them to himself as a hen would gather his chicks. Jerusalem represents all that God wanted the children of Israel to be as a holy place. It was the capital city. David's capital was established there after seven years in Hebron. But more importantly, it was the central place of worship for the Jewish people, the temple being built there and all of the great feasts taking place there. So there's a sense in which the centrality of the location of Jerusalem stands instead for God's righteousness that's going to be demonstrated through Jerusalem as a fulfillment of prophecy, specifically with reference to coming of the Messiah. The Gentiles are going to see your Jerusalem's righteousness, not because the physical place was inherently righteous, but because of what's going to take place in the area of Jerusalem, specifically with reference to the preaching, teaching ministry of Jesus in and around the temple, and most specifically with reference to his death right outside of the city. The land as a whole, Jerusalem, would not be forsaken. It would not be desolate, but rather it would become a light. Now, you know, and I know that within a generation of Jesus' uh, death and his resurrection, his ascension, that the city of Jerusalem was captured and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. It still exists, but this text speaks about its not forsaken stature. It's not desolate stature, but it's continuing delight stature. And all of that focuses on the role that it would play because it is the beginning place, the origin, 
the pivotal point at which the kingdom of God comes to earth in a physical way with reference to the proclamation of the gospel in its fullest days, in its fullest time. That, of course, is fulfilled in the opening chapters of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Notice also the language, and I apologize, Jerusalem's misspelled on that last line there. Jerusalem, the daughter of Zion, is going to be referred to as the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, the sought out, and a city not forsaken. All of these are figurative expressions to describe what Jerusalem is going to be in the new age. And even beyond the new age, what we see it described as in the context of the book of Revelation where John sees the Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And so Jerusalem personifies everything that righteousness is, uh, that's going to be accomplished by the righteousness of Jesus. And it's because of what happened uh, through Jesus' work and Jesus' teaching, and specifically Jesus' death in the confines of that city. Let's move a little forward now. And let's look at this passage in the book of Luke, chapter 2, starting in verse 25. We only have verses 29 and following on the screen. And notice that Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Again, the translators have emphasized the word consolation by capitalizing it, indicating that it is significant, that it refers to a specific concept, a specific idea, and in this context, even more importantly, a specific person. He came to witness the Jesus, who was presented by his parents in this dedication on this occasion. And so the consolation of Israel is Messiah Jesus. So look at the language here. He speaking, Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. What did he see? He saw Joseph and Mary. Yes. He saw other people who would have been gathered there. Yes. But in this context, the salvation focuses specifically on the means by which salvation is ultimately going to be accomplished. And that's not just through the birth of Jesus and the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, but his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. He saw the beginning of that. And he says, you have prepared this salvation in this little infant who is going to be the Messiah. You have prepared your salvation before the face of all peoples, all peoples, not just the Jews who would have been gathered at that time in the context of the city of Jerusalem, by the way, but all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. That's not Israel. That's not the scriptures of Old Testament Israel. That's not the scriptures of New Testament Israel, the kingdom of God. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And the glory of your people, Israel, is not Israel's glory because of something that Israel did. But in this context, the glory of your people, Israel, is this baby who would be the Messiah, Jesus. My point in looking at all of these contexts to this point is that a light to the nations refers exclusively and continuously to Jesus. And it's our proclamation of the light, the message that bears witness to who Jesus is. I am not the light. You are not the light. The church as a whole is not the light, but it reflects and bears the light. The light is ultimately Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 1 and following. That's the message. A Messiah to the nations is a light to the nations. Let's look next in this passage in Acts chapter 13, where we see we turn to the Gentiles. Again, we start in verse 42 for the greater context. We're only going to look at verses 46 through 48. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be speaking to, spoken to you first. That's the Jews. But since you, the Jews, reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, it's not that God did not want to redeem them. It's not that they were not worthy of salvation from God's perspective, but they themselves judged themselves unworthy. God saw they were worthy to hear the message. They considered themselves unworthy. And because of that, he says, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, not because Paul was the light but because he was a light bearer, because he was a messenger bearer of the one who is truly the light. And that, of course, is Jesus. 
And so the emphasis on us as part of the kingdom of God as the church as a light must always be understood as bearers of the light, as messengers of the light, and not the light itself. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Wish we had time to explore that in some detail. So very quickly, we have looked at the translation. We've looked at the meaning of that translation. We've looked at it, the use of the term light as it appears in a very broad way in the context of the book of Isaiah. We've looked at key passages in the, in the book of Isaiah in which some concept of a light to the nations is reflected. And then we looked at two New Testament passages, one in Luke chapter 2 and then this one in Acts chapter 13. And I would like us to consider some lessons for today. And you can see all of these at once. If everything would have been working perfectly with the slides, it would have appeared line at a time. So you can see where I'm going here. The kingdom of God, the church, does not exist for its own glory. The church doesn't save. Jesus saves. And it's the job of the church to preach the message of salvation in Jesus. The kingdom of God does not exist for self-satisfaction or glory. The kingdom of God exists for the honor and glory of God. It is his church, not my church, not your church, not anyone's church individually or in any collection of individuals, even all of those who are saints at this time in this place. The kingdom of God exists to tell others about God, about his holiness and about his glory. The kingdom of God exists to spread God's light to the nations. The light to the nations is not the church. It's not the kingdom. It's the message of the kingdom that focuses on Messiah Jesus, a message of grace, a message of mercy, a message of forgiveness found only in Messiah Jesus. We often make this distinction when people ask the question, do you believe your church says? And if we are key in the way we answer it, and particular the way it's presented, we will know, no, Jesus saves, but we as members of the church are the body of the saved. The saving power applies to Jesus. The repository or the collection of those who are saved are in his kingdom. Jesus is the light, not me. I am to bear message of that light. That's something that John himself was supposed to do. That is John the Immerser or John the Baptizer in the opening verses of John where Jesus is identified as the light. And then as we near the close of our lesson, the messengers are never as important as the message. The messengers are never as important as the message. Who I am pales in comparison to what I say if what I say is all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about my style. It's not about my oratory. It's not about how gifted I might appear or how I might come across in the way I present the truth. Paul was sometimes criticized for being weak in his appearance before others, but yet his message was the power of God and salvation. And so it must be in our case. We are only the messengers. Messiah Jesus has been, is now, and must always be the message. And we don't just walk around all the time just saying Jesus, 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 but everything about Jesus, everything that centers on Jesus, focuses on Jesus, that Jesus would have us to know, to believe, to understand, and to put into practice. That's the centrality of the message. It's the atoning power of Jesus' blood that cleanses, not me. It's our task as Christians to focus the message on Messiah Jesus, not on us, not on our buildings, not on our programs, not on our schools, not on our accomplishments, not on any great things that we might think uh, 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 ascribe to greatness, but on Jesus. Messiah Jesus, he is the true light, which gives light to every man who comes into the world. That's John chapter 1 and verse 9. He remains the true light to the nations. Yes, as messengers of Jesus 
we reflect and we bear and we carry that light to others. But let us never forget that Jesus is the one who is the ultimate light to the nations around us. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you very much, Brother Jody Apple, for your presentation. And even though you started late because of the technical difficulties, you still finished on time. We are so grateful to that. And we see the reactions on the chat group where people are saying, Amen. Drop the mic. Right. So I think the, your message got home, and I'm sure that those on Facebook also appreciate that. So we're doing well with the time. Let me introduce now our next song leader, and then we'll go into the speaker. We have Mr. Davian, Damian Lowe. Brother Damian Lowe, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm right here. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's over to Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are definitely grateful to be here this evening. We'll be singing this chorus now, and I lift your name. Kneel at the cross is what we have on our slide. Kneel at the cross. Let us sing at this time. Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice, leave with him your care, and begin life anew. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross. Jesus will meet you there. Kneel at the cross. There is room for all who would his glory share. Bliss there awaits. Harm can ne'er befall those who are anchored there. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross. Jesus will meet you there. Kneel at the cross, give your idols up, look unto realms above. Turn not again to our sparkling cup, trust always in his love. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross, Jesus will meet you there. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Damien. Our next speaker hails from Trinidad and Tobago. This speaker was baptized into Christ by his father in July 1996. Thereafter, he began using his gift as an excellent song leader. 14 years after his conversion, he was called to the ministry and he was moved to the Karipachima Church of Christ in 2013. He spent four years with the Karipachima Church there, and that congregation is now called Mission Road Church of Christ. 
Uh, this brother was ordained as the senior minister in that congregation and faithfully served there for the past five years. This brother is a devoted brother, has a lovely wife who backs him and supports him in every way. He has studied the scriptures diligently. He now holds a bachelor's in biblical studies. He's currently pursuing his master of divination or divinity. And because of his reverence for Christ and his commitment to scripture, he diligently ensures that every message faithfully communicates the timeless truth of God in a relevant and impactful way. Brothers and sisters, he's a dynamic uh, gospel preacher with the ability to present God's word, tactical and applicable in everyday living. I speak of no other than Brother Anderson George of Trinidad and Tobago. Brother George. To begin, begin my thanking, thanking brother, brother short for those words, words of introduction, let me also extend my gratitude and appreciation to the annual Caribbean Lectureship Regional Oversight Committee for the privilege to be among the cadre of speakers that have been selected. It would also be remiss of me if I did not pay special homage to uh, my brother from another mother, uh, as, as well as, as my co-Libra and, and brother in, in the faith, faith uh, Randolph Joseph, uh, and uh, his lovely congregation where he lives, the San Nicholas Church, for hosting me even now, uh, as well as the tech team for everything that you would see on, on the screen. With those, those things said, now turn with me, to not tap in your Bibles, Bible, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter, chapter number 49. 49. Isaiah 49, 49. I want to commend it to verse number one and culminate at verse, verse number three. three. Isaiah 49, 49. commencing at verse number one, culminating at verse, verse number three. three. I'll, I'll be using the New American Standard Bible, and that only means it may be read differently from the translation you have in your hand, but you should have no difficulty in following. Scripture says, listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has conceived me. And he has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. Brother, brother, could, we, could I just interrupt you? Because there is an echo coming through and some people are having difficulty in hearing you. Apparently there's another instrument or device on somewhere. So could you just use a, a minute or two to get that clarified? My apologies. Verse three again says, he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. But if you remember that I stand, I stand before you, we we were still having the echo, and um, is it? I know that there are other people because they are posting that they are having some difficulty and they can't understand that something needs to be turned off. I want you to know that the prophetic utterances of Isaiah are rooted in the tripartite promise given to Abraham in Genesis chapter number twelve. You would recall that God calls Abraham from all of the Chaldees, and he says to them, "Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great." And, and so, so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and, and curse those who curse you. And, and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It is here that scripture tells us that Abraham's seed was to be a blessing that is to come upon the families of all the earth. And, and so, so as we follow Abraham, we realize that Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah, and the rest of his brethren, Judah begat Perez, Perez begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Naishon, Naishon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, and from Jesse we have David the king, and at David's lineage and history, God appears to him one more time and confirms a new covenant that we call the Davidic covenant, where the son of David would also be the son of God, and the throne of his kingdom will be established forever. 
but, but king after king, king comes up, and, and each is progressively worse than, than the previous, thus they leading the nation of Israel into idolatry and uh, rebellion. It is in this religious and political climate that Isaiah enters into the scene and with pragmatic prophetic progress proclaims that Israel has deviated from God's mission for them. He says in chapter number one that they are sinful nation. He says they, in verse number four, are weighed down with iniquity and an offspring of evil doers, sons who have acted corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord and despised the Holy One of Israel. They, they have turned, turned away, away from, from him. him. For, For this, this reason, Israel now stands uh, condemned and deserving of, of God's judgment. But, but in, in the midst of judgment, there is still a, a message of hope. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number two, Isaiah prophesies and gives a promise of hope. He says, Now it will, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established as the chief of the mountains, mountains and will be raised up above the hills. All the nations will stream to it, and, and many people come and say, Come, let, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his path. It is this hope that Isaiah magnifies and expounds from the latter chapters of his book, from, from chapters 40, 40 to verse number 46. What, what is interesting to me is in spite of Israel's failure, in spite of their idolatry and rebellion, God is still faithful to his promise. And, and here, permit me to pause for a Bible commercial and a brief break to celebrate the fact that the plans of God cannot be thwarted. Help me celebrate that Israel's failure does not nullify God's promises, nor does it make it the but, uh, excuse me, Isaac had a dysfunctional family because of favoritism. Brother George, are you hearing me? Who would visit temples not for praise but for prostitutes? Jacob also had a problem where he had a favorite son, and we could go on with this list, but in spite of their dysfunction, in spite of their, of their failure, in spite of their shortcomings, God, God was still able to work with them, work around them, and, and bring about his plan and his, his promise. And I'm glad because it allows me to know even now I could be a mess, mess and, and God, God could use me in my mess and, and still bring about his success and, and use me for his message. message. That's, That's a good thing to hear. God is God all by himself. And so when Israel's moral aptitude and spiritual compass was broken, Broken, God, God himself, himself raised up a servant who will fulfill his, his plans. Now we're in Isaiah 49 and in verse number, number one. And I, I want, want you to know that this is the second of four, four servant songs. The, the first servant song is in Isaiah 42. And, and it introduces us to the idea, idea that, that God himself has chosen and raised up a servant. Chapter 49 begins with the servant's message. In verse number one, he concludes, uh, or he begins with his ministry. And in verse number six, we have his message. Sticking with my assignment of verses one to three, we would see that the servant's message introduces us to two things, his person and his preparation. In regards to his person, God calls him my uh, servant. Servant is a name and noun that indicates God is his master. It means that as a servant, he has no will independent of his master. He has no will of his own. The servant's will is the will of the one who sends him, the one who ordains him, the one who commissions him. My is a possessive pronoun that indicates relationship. The servant belongs to God, not necessarily in the sense of ownership, but rather in the sense that God himself has chosen the servant. God himself has ordained him to his task. You put them together and you get my servant, a servant selected by God, a servant ordained by God for God's purpose and prepared by God for God's success. So because this servant is ordained, because he's selected, because he is God's servant, God is able to save 
that you are my servant Israel in whom I will show my glory. Watch this church. Because God selected, because God prepared, because God ordained his servant, the end result was a foregone conclusion. I want to say that again. Because God did all that he did, the end result was a foregone conclusion. Because God intervened, because God prepared, because he selected, it was already decided beforehand. Through this servant, salvation would come. Not just for Israel, but also the nations, and it would be God's doing, so it would end with God's glory. Now, that's his person. We want to talk about his preparation. The servant says that the Lord called him from his mother's womb, and from the body of his mother, the Lord named him. This is but to say that before he knew who he was, God already knew. Before he found his purpose, God already determined and knew what his purpose was going to be. His selection was not by accident, nor was it a plan B. From eternity, in the mind of God, he was foreordained and predetermined to be a light to the nations. His calling and preparation begins in eternity, in the mind of God. Because God sees all time, at the same time, he not only calls his servant, but prepares him in advance for that which he calls him to. The servant is being prepared by God who calls him for what he has not yet faced. So he says, God made my mouth like a sharp sword. This is a metonymy where mouth refers not to the body part, but rather the words that would come out from the organ. Here God prepares uh, his servant to effectively proclaim um, God's message. It's effective because his mouth is not just like a sword, it's a sharp sword. And so the imagery is that of a military leader who determines his strength, who determines his prowess by his numbers and his weapons. The servant, on the other hand, displays uh, his prowess not with a physical sword, but rather with the word of his God. If I had time, I will tell you that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the word of God that pricks. It's the word of God that convicts. It's the word that renews and transforms what we need today as we need light ourselves and to be light to the nation is not just a word, but the word. What we need today is the word that comes from God. And so the serpent has been prepared and prepared effectively with the sharp sword that is the word of God. Not only is his mouth like a sharp sword, but what we're told is that God has made him like a select arrow. Now bear with me here. He uses a second imagery, that of an archer. And an archer in the time of Isaiah would be one who would polish his arrow, not just the tip, but the shaft. And he polishes uh, the shaft and he rubs it down. He files it so that it becomes smooth to ensure that the arrow is aerodynamic. Now, he wants it to be aerodynamic because nothing must deflect it in its flight towards the target. What he's saying here is that God didn't just prepare him, but God prepared him for effectiveness. Because God was involved, it was sure to accomplish the task which God designed it for. The first time he said it was his mouth that was prepared, but now the imagery moves from the mouth to the man. He didn't say his mouth is like a polished arrow, but that he is a polished arrow. God not only gives uh, the servant the word, but God shapes and equips the one who will herald the word. When you consider, watch this, that the sword is for close combat, but the arrow is for long distance. What you have from Isaiah is a complete image that this servant is ready to face anything. He's been prepared from eternity in advance for every, every challenge, every obstacle, everything he doesn't even think about, God has already fixed it so that he is prepared. It doesn't matter who the servant faces or what he has encountered or will encounter, God has effectively equipped 
and prepared him for the task ahead. All oh, that's good, but what I love personally is that inside there, he didn't just say that God made my mouth like a sharp sword and he made me like a polished arrow. What I love personally is what he says in between the two. If you read it with me, verse number two, he says, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He has concealed me. He has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. It's not just that the servant has been equipped and prepared for his ministry, but between the imagery of the sharp sword and the polished arrow is a reference to God's hands. Watch this. Watch God's hands. He says, in the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. What the servant wants you to get is that he feels a shadow over him. Now, when you think about a shadow, a shadow isn't the thing, but it points to the very real thing close by. You don't see a shadow and think about something far away. The shadow indicates that there is a very real and a close presence. And so this idea is not just that I have been prepared, not just that I have been made effective, but as I am going through what I'm going through, the presence of God is right there with me. His hand is over my life. What that means for the servant is that as he goes on his journey, he doesn't need to necessarily worry about his equipping. He just needs to make sure that the hand of God is always with him. As long as that hand is always with him, he'll be prepared for the task ahead. That's the first part that I like. The presence of God is with him in his ministry. But then personally, probably over the last few weeks, Seeing that God has hidden him in his quiver makes me feel secure, even as a minister now. It says, God has hidden his servant in his quiver. So I want you to picture an archer. And an archer in those days would have a quiver strapped around him. And that quiver would have all his polished arrows. Let me use the other hand. I'm left-handed. Would have... A all his arrows at the ready to pull. Now watch this. He doesn't pull it until the time is right. The arrow is there. It's prepared. It's polished. But the archer does not pull that arrow from his quiver until he's ready to launch it. And the moment he's ready to launch it is when he knows it's going to hit its target. The timer has been accomplished. So what he says is, not only am I prepared, but I have the hand of God in my life. And I feel like an arrow in his quiver. What that means is I'm already destined for success. I'm already set up for a comeback. I'm already fixed for a victory because God is holding me for the right time. No, 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 if you're sitting there and you're wondering why that makes me happy. So that sounds good, but I don't know if that's a word for me on today. Let me give you some theology, and then I'll give you some autopraxy, and we could go home. Theologically, this text not only refers to Israel's deliverance from Babylonian captivity, but also prophetically, it looks forward to the Messiah, who Paul would say in Galatians, in the fullness of time. If I was back home, I'd be shouting. In the fullness of time, was sent by a woman and born of God, of this Messiah, who was sent at the right time, fully equipped, prepared and ordained by God. Peter, the apostle, would say in Acts 2, verse number 22, ye men of Israel, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves already know. He being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up having loosed the pains of death because it wasn't possible that he should be holden of it. I want to back up. Peter says, this is a man, Jesus of Nazareth, approved of God. 
Just as the servant in Isaiah was ordained and selected and prepared, Peter now comes and he says that this Jesus was also approved, selected, ordained by God himself. He didn't just say that. He said he was delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God. Now watch this. We know that the Jews crucified Jesus, but theology tells us God delivered him to be crucified. It was the predeterminate council, that's the King James, and for ordination of God. Those are just words to tell you that before Jesus came to earth, he already knew his assignment. He was already ordained, selected, and prepared. God decided before he said, let there be light that Jesus would be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of, of the world. I know that's right because there is uh, another passage. Peter, in First Peter, he would come and he would say that this Jesus was foreknown uh, before the foundation of the world. The fact that he was foreknown gives us the idea that Jesus is and was prepared from eternity. He was appointed and ordained, and that's why he's called uh, the Messiah, when he got up from the river Jordan, God announces him as the beloved son in whom he is well pleased. There is a manifestation of the spirit as it depends, descends upon him like a dove. And from that time, Jesus is led in the power of the spirit into ministry that God already equipped, prepared, and ordained him for. So now Jesus could say, if I be lifted up. I will draw all men unto me. And so Paul could declare, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first, but also to the Greeks, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Aren't you glad that Jesus is the servant of God, whose ministry was to be a light to the nations, but wait, there's more. God did not just make Jesus light. He's also made you to be a light. I read somewhere, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is uh, in heaven. The light you shine may not be your own, but rather the light of him who is in you. And what I want to tell you is this. If the Spirit of God is in you, that means that God, through His Spirit, is working on you. I need to say that again. See, if the Spirit of God is in you, what that means is that God, through His Spirit, is working in you. God can make you equipped. God can shape you and prepare you to live as a light to the nations. Your effectiveness in ministry and as a Christian comes not from your own doing, but rather God working in you. God is the one who does the gifting. God is the one who does the transforming. God is the one who does the shaping. God is the one who does the ordaining. So let God be God and you be a light. Let me say it again. Let God be God and you be a light. You see too many times uh, and in too many churches, we're doubting how great our God is because we're limiting God by our own inability. And so we don't think we could do greater because we don't have the finances. We don't think that we could do more because we don't have the people. We limit God based on how we view our own sufficiency. But I serve a God who is all sufficient. And I just believe that God, because he sees all time at the same time, just as he saw Adam and Eve was going to sin, just as he saw man was going to repent, already saw what you need to do in your time, how you are going to bless persons in your job, in your family. And he is right now equipping you. He is right now calling you. He's right now selecting you and ordaining you. What you think might be a trial might be the equipping of God. What you think might make no sense to you might all fit into the plan of God that you may only realize sometime down the road. So now, as a child of God, remember his spirit is inside of you. And we don't walk by faith. We walk by Sorry, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And because we walk by faith, we're led by God's spirit. He's leading, he's equipping, he's shaping, he's guiding. And so my effectiveness 
is not based on me and my insufficiency, but the God inside of me. So let God be God and you be a light. God has already placed within you his spirit so that you can accomplish his purpose. Let God be God and you just be a light. Don't worry that you're not old enough or not educated enough or a Christian long enough. God sees all time at the same time and could use you as you are even now at the right time for his purpose and his glory. So let God be God and you just be a light. Thank you very much, Brother Anderson George. Uh, we had a little technical difficulty at the start, but certainly we were able to pick up quite well as he, as we got the sound matters under control. And I'm sure that I'm seeing the re reactions of persons. Amen, amen. Thank you very much for the word, a great message. And I hope those who are on Facebook were able to be blessed with the word from Brother Anderson George this evening. I'm going to ask the Brother Lowe to, Lo to come in and uh, to give us a song, if possible, to bring us down to the end of tonight, the first evening of our annual Caribbean Lectureship 2022. And then we are going to invite you to join us tomorrow evening. It's not going to be the same time. We are going to start 7 p.m. the Atlantic Standard Time, and which I suspect that is going to be... I think the Atlantic Standard Time, they are one hour behind or one hour ahead. But the third is, are they ahead or, or behind? Um, it, I believe we are ahead. Uh, it's going to be 8 o'clock our time in Bermuda. It's going to be a 7 in Eastern, uh, the Eastern Caribbean at least. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Brother Lou, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm right here. Let us let us sing. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. And I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt you pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high Amen, amen, amen. Tomorrow evening, and I'll just give you what's taking place tomorrow evening, and I'll let the chairman, if he has any closing words. But tomorrow evening, we start at um, 7 o'clock Atlantic Standard Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, Mass of Ceremony tomorrow is Brother Adrian Sukdio. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. And the song leader is Brother Marlon Williams and Brother James Solomon. Uh, Brother Solomon is from St. Lucia. I'm not sure, I can't recall where Brother Marlon is from, but um, the presenters tomorrow is our chairman, uh, Brother Thaddeus Bruno, who will speak on the topic, the time of God's favor in, from Isaiah chapter 49 and verse eight. And Brother James Sanderson, is going to speak on the topic, the honor of God's servants from Isaiah chapter 49, five to seven. So we look forward tomorrow, once again, to have all of you here, invite somebody to come with you. We had a wonderful attendance of 597 on tonight, and we have others on YouTube and Facebook. I'm sure we could double this tomorrow. Brother Thaddeus Bruno. Thank you very much, Brother Michael. Uh, to God be the glory. We've had two marvelous um, lectures this evening, and um, we're just uh, rejoicing in what God has done. 
I just like to do um, uh, a little uh, uh, housekeeping maybe. Um, we had asked our, our final speaker each evening to uh, go ahead and announce God's terms of pardon for those in the audience who may not be Christians, who may have been touched by the message and wanting to respond um, to Christ. I'd like to just take a, a, a few seconds and do that. Um, Jesus, as we heard tonight, is uh, the light of the world, and God has prepared him um, from eternity, prepared us as well as his servants. And in his death on the cross of Calvary, he paid the price for our sins, and on his resurrection from the dead, he commissioned his apostles to go and preach the gospel tell all nations of uh, salvation and it being available in Christ. And if you stand outside of Christ this evening, we'd just like to encourage you to meet Christ on his terms, and those terms include uh, faith in him, in his claim to be the Son of God, um, repentance from sins, making up your mind to turn from living your way to living God's way, confession of faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and baptism in water for the remission of sins, and not as an outward sign of an inward grace to show the world that you are already saved. But in that act, Paul says, we receive the forgiveness of our sins in the blood of Jesus, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. And if you are one of our guests, um, even though you are in cyberspace at this time, you can certainly get in touch with us via the chat feature, and we will arrange to put you in touch with someone in your physical area who can further assist you in obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me take the opportunity to remind our speakers tomorrow and the following nights if they would um, remember uh, to do this and also to remember to um, come, come in on the Zoom platform um, about half an hour before start time. Um, that allows us to, to do uh, checks in terms of sound checks, um, in terms of slides. And we can, in that time, find out if there are any glitches, et cetera. And we can make this a, a more um, pleasant and um, edifying experience for everyone. So please. Um, do not show up um, five minutes before start time or even after start time. Um, come in on time so we can, even in this matter, uh, be a light to the nations. Uh, thank you very much. I turn over to Brother Michael for um, any other closing remarks or pray. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll end with a word of prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we are so mindful of your grace and your mercy. For we are thankful for this first evening's session where we are able to hear your pure word preached to us in depth and explained to us in powerful ways. We pray to God that you are going to cause this annual Caribbean lectureship to be a blessing to the hearts, the growth, the life of all of us as Christian, and cause others who have not yet surrendered their lives to you and be born again to desire to do such. We are thankful, Father, and ask your blessing upon Brother Ken Dai for his wonderful vision 
and for all those who have gone before and who have supported this great effort. Continue to bless, guide, and protect. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.